did. You crazy son of a bitch, you did. All players, low down, active, hold by 1327. Put tactical. Well, you asked for it. Here we are from your eyes to your ears, the Merge Podcast. Episode one, uh, I'm your host, Mike Benitez, and our goal is to be one of the top 10 defense podcasts. Uh, it's actually a pretty low bar. I think there's only about 20 of them out there in this niche, so uh, we're really shooting for average right now. So I guess the uh, the world's best defense uh, newsletter is going to now make the world's most okayest podcast. So here's how we're going to do it. Uh, we have a few different variations and formats we're going to try out, but at the end of the day, our goal is to be the Long Island Ice Tea podcast. So it's a little bit of the good stuff, and we'll see how it all kind of comes together. And hopefully at the end of the day, it's one strong uh, cocktail. Uh, on that note, today I'm actually joined by two co-hosts, Jake and Tim. Jake, how about you tell us about yourself? Thanks, Mike. I love the goal, by the way, of the world's most okayest defense podcast. That's like the right bar for me. <laughs> Manage expectations. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, set them low and maybe overperform. You know, we'll see what happens. So I've been a venture capitalist most of my career, um, almost my entire career, uh, doing mostly defense tech investing, or I'd say deep tech investing, and that has led to investing a lot in the national security space. Uh, most recently with the Army Venture Capital Corporation and currently with Mark Venture Capital. Awesome. And we'll get to what the hell is venture capital uh, in a little bit. So that's a, that's a good segue. So we'll put a pin in that. Uh, our another co-host we have here is Tim. So Tim, say hi to everyone and tell us about yourself. Hey, everybody. Tim Nolan. Uh, so 20 years here, uh, active service, uh, soon to be retired. Um, been in the uh, defense innovation space for probably five years now. Had, uh, had worked with an Air Force Special Operations to, to stand up our innovation program and, and have kind of been really passionate about integrating and, and commercializing technologies into the Department of Defense so that we can kind of make things suck less for our warfighters out there, right? Because there's, there's a lot of stuff that the, their service members are having to deal with and a lot of pain points. And uh, so I've kind of fallen into the mission of, of how do we improve that and make things better for, for our service members. So that's a little bit about me. Awesome. So, um, and a little bit by, about myself, uh, I am retired 25 years in the military, eight in the Marine Corps, 17 in the Air Force, uh, been around the world, done a lot of stuff, a lot of operations, uh, some time in Congress, some time in the Pentagon, some time at DARPA, some time in operational test, fighter background. And I spent some time in Silicon Valley a few years ago, and this is, uh, this was 2020 BC. That's, uh, before COVID. And that's actually where Jake, Tim and I met. And so that's kind of the, the thread that kind of ties us all together. And one of the reasons I wanted to, the three of us to kind of talk about a few things on at least episode one, hopefully many more episodes, is that we all have a different background, but we're kind of like a Venn diagram. There's some overlaps between them, and I think it'll make a really interesting conversation. And so that's really why we're all here today. So what we're going to do today in our first episode is we're going to talk about three things today. And I was just thinking about this. None of these three things I've ever actually mentioned in the 100 and something editions that I've done the newsletter. So I don't know how I, uh, I got this far without talking about any of these things. But today we're going to talk about venture capital, TikTok, and American dynamism, which is the latest buzzword. So we're going to go back to Jake. I met you working at a different venture capital firm. Tell us, what is venture capital? At its core, venture capital is equity investment. So that is cash for uh, ownership in a business. Venture capital is fairly early on in a business's life cycle. So we're all pretty familiar with investing in stocks, right? Cash for equity. But most of us are only investing in public companies, right? Public companies have hundreds, probably more like thousands or tens of thousands of employees. Most public companies are cash flow positive, which means they're actually earning a profit, not burning money every month. Uh, and those businesses grow because of that, their later stage, they grow a little bit more slowly. So a, a great public company, I don't know, is growing 5, 10, 15% a year, something like that. 
venture capital, you're investing very early traditionally. So it could be one person, could be two, three or four people. That's very early stage. Sort of late stage venture might be 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 people, but still much, much smaller than the kinds of companies uh, most of us are investing in. Most venture capital companies, almost all of them, are not profitable. So they're, they're burning money every month. That money's going towards salaries and R&D and software engineers who are writing code. Uh, that sounds like a bad investment, right? Why would you ever invest in a business that's losing money every month? And in fact, their projections are probably telling you that they'll be losing money for the next two, three, four, five years, right? So it's, it's going to be a black hole for your investment for quite a while. And there's a pretty good chance that your investment goes to zero because they're losing money every month. Well, you do it because if you're successful, that business might 10x or 100x in terms of its value from the day you invest in it, right? So if you had invested in Uber when it was just five or 10 people, you might have made a thousand times your money for every dollar you put in. Um, so you, you accept a much higher risk for the chance of a, of a great outcome. So at its core, that's venture capital. It's finding early stage tech companies that are losing money today but have the chance at really impacting the world at you know massive scale. So what I hear is there's uh, there's public companies and there are private companies. Public companies you can buy and sell sh- uh, shares on the the stock exchange and they uh, they live and die by their quarterly earnings statements. And then you have private companies and how private companies are funded is they're either self funded, they go get funding that's private equity PE or they get funding from VC, is that right? Yeah, that's fair. Although um, normally when people say private equity, they mean really large, late stage, pre-public investment firms. So usually these are firms that are managing multiple billions. But technically venture capital itself is private equity. It's just a very small slice of private equity that comes in at the like riskiest opportunities. Gotcha. So uh, big risk, big reward. That's kind of the name of the game. So if I understand it right, and I learned this uh, back when we met a few years ago, um, you know, this goes back to basically hunting for whales, right? Back in the in the Northeast, you know, a couple hundred years ago. And I think the, the, the whole point was you go out, spend two or three years at sea, and you may or may not you know, ever come back with a whale. And so you would uh, send multiple ships and multiple crews and hedge your bets and send them in multiple places uh, with mathematically there the certainty of coming back with a whale made that investment up front to to send so many ships out at sea pay for itself is that about right that's right that's right and that that tradition factors into how vcs are compensated today like even today so the way vcs make money is you get a percentage of every dollar you manage, right? So if I if I raise a venture fund and I raise $100 million, I might get 2% a year of that money, and that pays my salary and my operations and for my team. Um, it's not a, not a bad deal. But the real way VCs make money, or the way you hope you make money, is what's called carried interest, or your carry. And that is a percentage of the profits on your, your business venture. So if I take that $100 million and I invest in 100 companies, a million dollars each, that would be a pretty broad portfolio, but I turn it into $200 million. So I double the money over some span of time. That $100 million in profit, I might get 20% of that as my compensation for driving the profit. And that's really, that's really the, the, the upside of being a venture capitalist is in the carried interest. And carry carries over from the days of, of whale hunting and shipping where that was basically the deal the, the captains had was you will get a share of the, the returns, right? The upside. Yeah. And that's called a, a two and 20 or a 20 and two kind of a split, right? Where it's uh, 2% for the carry and 20% over your, um, your objective return. Is that right? I'm probably totally screwing this up. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so two and 20 is the, that's, that's the median model. That's what most VCs are getting paid. And then you've got some of them out there who are taking 3% management fees or 30% carry. Uh, that's, that's not the average. You know, we started in whaling hundreds of years ago in New England. And then suddenly, for those who aren't aware, Silicon Valley uh, out in California is the largest concentration of venture capital investors in the whole world. 
So I think it's a it's a fascinating pivot to go. How do we go from from whaling in, in Massachusetts to a bunch of people in tech in California? And I, and I want to say, I think that goes back to after World War II and the, the advent of the semiconductor in the late 60s, early 70s. And so all these tech companies started uh, popping up. VC industry out here in Silicon Valley sprung up early on in the semiconductor industry, basically spurred the early semiconductor industry. And so it was like tightly integrated with the Department of Defense because obviously the Department of Defense itself is what sort of jumpstarted the semiconductor industry out here in Silicon Valley for guidance systems and, you know, supercomputers and all the things that we need, uh, the DOD needs the chips for today. Yeah, there's actually, there's a great book. It's uh, called The Secret History of Silicon Valley. It's about how uh, a lot of tech that was developed on World War II out there actually helped uh, win the war, whether it's uh, radars, electronic warfare, electromagnetic magnetic spectrum, and that kind of and vacuum tube driven systems. And then the pivot into silicon is kind of how uh, the area got its name. And there was a there was a time there where you know yada 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 the Department of Defense the military left, and Silicon Valley became a predominantly commercial investment driven ecosystem. So uh, and we'll get to that in a little bit, which is I think our last topic of the day. So what I hear Jake is that you get a lot of money, you make a lot of bets, and you're you're hit, you know you hit a home run if you strike out you know ninety times out of a hundred, and you hit a couple of, of grounders and one home run, it kind of all pays for itself. That's right, and, and you touched on this with your uh, your whaling analogy too, right? I mean, the average venture investment doesn't work out, and that could mean that the company goes to zero and nothing ever comes of it. It could mean the company, you know, returns half the money you put in, or you get you get two times your money back. But that's really a failure in VC. Like, what you need to be successful is you need uh, a company to be a fifty x or a hundred x in the portfolio. Um, so most venture firms say you've got a portfolio of 20 companies in a, in a fund cycle, uh, and you roughly expect that portfolio to break down a third, a third, a third, where a third of your companies are total failures or largely failures, a third of your companies return capital or maybe a little bit. And then it's, it's definitely less than a third, but then the sort of the top of the portfolio is what generates almost all your returns. So I think industry, the industry-wide statistic is that about 6% of portfolio company investments made by venture capitalists return like 60% of the industry's returns. Um, so it's really outlier successes drive the industry. So when we talk about partners, there's uh, there's two types, right? There's a uh, LP and GPs. Can you uh, kind of explain the difference and which one you are? Sure. So I'm a GP, a general partner. General partner is someone at the fund generally who makes decisions at the fund and is effectively an owner of the fund or the firm. A uh, limited partner is someone who invests in the firm and definitely does not have day-to-day -day decision-making authority and whose decision-making authority is generally limited. Although uh, if you're a large enough limited partner and you've invested enough money in the fund, you're sort of like a shareholder in a company. So you have some say in certain governance decisions. Every fund is a little bit different. So Tim, what I what I heard is that when we go out, that he should foot all the bills at the bar. <laughs> that, that's my big takeaway. There's a lot of money moving through there. You can play some bets on us at the bar. Uh <laughs> the tradition in the venture industry is when two fund managers go out to lunch or drinks or whatever, it's the largest fund pays. Almost always, largest fund pays. So. When I have no fund and you have a fund, so you automatically have to pay then, right? I, I'm on the hook unless I invite another friend. <laughs> That's right. I'm going to invite a bigger, a bigger whale. <laughs> That's right. Jake, I got a question for you. You know, I, I, we talk about the carried interest and, and all this other stuff, right? Like that's the glamorous part of, of venture. Um, can you talk a little bit about like the actual, like the hard work that it takes to actually deploy the capital and like diligence companies and like, you know, maybe, maybe some rates, right? Because I, an anecdote that I can remember and just kind of, you know, set the stage is, is going to, you know, was, was invited out to an executive boardroom to one of the, one of the top firms out there. And, and I remember them saying like, Hey, we see about 15,000 companies come through our deal flow a year. And, uh, and we actually put forth about 200 of them to our investment committee. And out of those 200, we only invest in about five or six a year. Right. That's in a massive amount of, of work, right? And is that like a standard kind of thing across your experience with, with the rest of the industry? Or is that kind of an outlier? Or, or what are your, your thoughts on that? So one, I think the, a lot of venture firms throw around the stat of how many 
companies they look at at the very top of the funnel versus how many investments they make. And they use that when they're marketing themselves to LPs to raise money, right? They say, look, we looked at 10,000 companies last year. We invested in 10. So we're extremely selective. But that stat is incredibly gameable, right? Like how many quality companies did you look at last year? Like what, what was the quality level of the top of your funnel? That's what matters, but that's really hard to define, right? So I don't know, maybe not this year, but I think last year Y Combinator, which is a large uh, tech company accelerator, put through like 400 companies per batch through their accelerator program. So if you like glance at the website on their demo day, does that mean that you've looked at 400 companies, right? I guess you could claim that, but it's not really 400 quality companies that you've analyzed. It's just like 400 things you've heard of. So anyway, I digress. I just think it's a vanity metric. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm never going to complain about being a VC, right? Like there's a lot of work that goes into it, but I love every minute of my job, even the, the hard stuff. But it's not just like hanging out on a yacht, drinking daiquiris, and like cutting checks. <laughs> like there's a lot of work that goes into it. Um, you can certainly be lazy about it. And so your life is not a Jay Z video. As much as I'd like it to be, it's not quite a Jay Z video. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's totally me. I'm uh, I'm tone deaf, so you you do not want to see that. <laughs> you do not. You could coast in venture for a fun cycle for a few years before people realize you're not really doing any work and you just make a few investments without, you know, in companies that like are not competitive. So you're not having to, you know, earn your keep and like fight to get into the round and you're not doing a lot of diligence. But I think we're, we're kind of seeing the results right now of what happens when you don't do a lot of diligence, right? Like we don't need to talk about the FTX sort of crypto blow up today because it's all anyone's been talking about uh, online for the last couple of weeks. But, you know, maybe if people had done a little bit more diligence and, like, seen what they were up to, you could have been like, oh, yeah, this looks like a Ponzi scheme. Like, how do you guarantee 15% returns every year with zero risk? Like, I don't think that promise has ever been made and it's been anything other than a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> so it can be a lot of work, uh, although you could phone it in for a couple of years and get by. So tell me what's bad about venture capital, because all I hear is, is, you know, take my money. So if I, I want to give you my money to invest it so I can be rich. So what are some of the bad things about venture capital, especially tied to hardware and military type programs, or maybe the, the timelines are kind of incompatible with investor ex expectations? So what are the downsides of venture capital? Are, you mean as, as a venture capitalist or uh, as a company founder or for the, the country? Maybe yeah. There's definitely multiple lenses. Uh, I don't know. Just pick one and go with it, and we'll just uh, we'll just wrap about it. Well, so first of all, let's let's go from the company's perspective. So I think a lot of founders hear about venture capital and it sounds very sexy. And it's like, okay, I'm I'm creating this company. I want to go raise money from Sequoia or Andreessen or Founders Fund or Mark Ventures, right? Come to me. Uh, no one actually says that, but someday maybe <laughs> they will. Not yet. So they think it's sexy. But when you raise money from a venture capitalist, like it dramatically changes the way you run your business. So you're no longer trying to steadily grow a successful, profitable company. Not yet. Now you're trying to build your business fast enough that you can raise the next round because you're probably gonna have to raise money again. That means doubling your business every year, or tripling your business every year, something like that, right? So you've got a lot more pressure to grow more quickly. That's gonna drive up your burn rate, it means that you're gonna hire a lot more people than you can afford today. And the only way you can afford to keep doing that is you have to keep raising money. So the day you raise venture capital, you're on a treadmill. And you're on that treadmill because your investors are looking for 3x, 5x, 10x growth year on year over a number of years until you can IPO. Before you raise venture capital, you have the luxury of much slower growth, growing as cash flow allows you to grow. It's like a much less stressful lifestyle, potentially. Also, once you have VCs on board, they're probably on your board. So they're, they're like sort of in your shorts, right? Like they're seeing everything you're doing. They have opinions. You have a new boss. So when you say raising rounds, that's a series A, series B, series C. And, and those are, depending on the burn rate, is somewhere between 12 and 18 months between rounds. And you're, what you're really looking for is to get that return on investment. These are private companies. They have to IPO, which is they have to go public or get you know, acquired in some kind of exit to get that money back. Right. Right. So we talked earlier about the difference between a public and a private company. And one of the big differences is 
if you buy stock in a public company, you can sell it tomorrow and get your money back, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more, but it's liquid, it's, it's pretty liquid. When you buy stock in a private company, you can't sell it tomorrow. Like you are probably holding on to it until it IPOs and goes public or until another company buys it. And occasionally you can sell your stock on a secondary market. But there's a lot of restrictions. If you do that, you're probably gonna take a, a haircut on what you paid for it. So you're, you're giving up a lot of your upside. So you're in it for the long haul. An IPO, I think these days, the average company that IPOs is like eight and a half or nine years post-founding. So if you invest in the first year or two, that stock is, is on your balance sheet and illiquid for you know a decade. Okay. One last question, and then, and then uh, I want to jump into TikTok, because I think Tim has some really amazing dance videos on TikTok, actually. That's really what we want to get to. <laughs> can, can we see some of those today? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll splice them in. <laughs> The the last thing, so Jake, I know you when you were at Alpha Bridge before as a VC, and then you you came to try to rescue the Pentagon uh, with this thing called the Army Venture Capital Corporation. Ugh. I know it's a, this might be a, a traumatic experience. We don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. But what happened? You kind of came out from the the bullpen to help the Pentagon fix itself, and then uh, I don't know what happened. <laughs> Before we go any further, your announcement that you're going to the Army Venture Capital Corporation is still a pinned tweet in your uh, on your Twitter account. It is still a pinned tweet. It is still, uh, I think it's still my LinkedIn profile. Like I haven't appropriately grieved Army Venture Capital yet. Like that's really what's going on. <laughs> I'm like still working through. I'm like in the denial stage. Well, let's help you get through it. Let's just talk it out. <laughs> Tell me where he hurt you. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Show me on the doll. Show me on the doll. Where the Pentagon yeah, touched you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So for for your listeners who don't know, the Army Venture Capital Corporation was created by Congress in 2002 to be the Incutel for the Department of Defense. So Incutel created in 99 by Congress to basically be the CIA's venture firm has now grown across the IC um, and touches on some of what DOD does, especially in the sort of where Title 50 overlaps with Title 10. Um, in their infinite wisdom, three years later, Congress said, all right, DOD has a lot of the same problems, so we're going to give them effectively the same tool. We're going to call it Army Venture Capital. Uh, Army was the original executive agent, and uh, EQTEL was quite successful. Army Venture Capital wasn't. A lot of problems, uh, many of which you, you can blame the, the Army for, I think. You know, Army and CIA are not the same, and the, the tool should have probably been pretty different for the Army. Um, anyway, so it, it operates for about 10 years, doesn't have the financial success that InQtel has had, and arguably doesn't have the transition success, at least not from the Army's perspective, in terms of taking technology from Silicon Valley or regions around the country, innovative regions around the country, and actually getting it into the Army, into the warfighter's hands. Because of that, for the next 10 years, uh, it basically sits fallow. And then almost two years ago now, I came in with another group of uh, great Americans to try and revitalize it. So identify what the problems were, right? Where did this go wrong in the first 10 years of its life cycle? Uh, how do we get this refunded? Sort of the authorities were still on the books, although we're, we're pretty stale to the extent an authority can be stale. Uh, and what problems should be solving today? What do the services think about it? I spent about a year and a half doing that. And I would say uh, there was a lot of congressional support, bipartisan, bicameral, for something like InQtel for the DOD and maybe bringing it back to life uh, in the Army Venture Capital Corporation context. Um, Army had zero interest in uh, reliving that chapter of their life. Uh, I would say other services were pretty interested, um, particularly the services mm. that you, of all the services, you could probably pick the one that would be most interested in venture capital authorities. They were the most interested. But at the end of the day, Army was the, the owner of the structure. And so like six months ago, we decided we would be much more effective if we basically took what Army Venture Capital's mission had been relaunched it as a brand new entity and so that's what mark ventures is for us it's the same mission the same team or largely the same team trying to invest in technologies relevant to national security 
And our goal is ultimately to do it as a public-private partnership. So we're we're working hard to make that happen right now. But today it's all private money, private organization. Awesome. I did not know that. So that was uh, better lucky than good, I guess. <laughs> Thanks for, I did not not realize the connection between Mark Ventures and the Army Venture Capital Corporation. And by like episode five, we should do this with whiskey. And then we'll talk about what like that two year span of trying to reboot it like really looked like, but probably not a sober conversation. Yeah, we'll bring we'll bring out the dolls so you can point to the dolls too. This is where you touch me. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's weird how in a lot of ways if you want to make an impact with the DOD or you wanna you wanna support this overall mission, you almost have to depart the inside of the system and work outside, right? And create leverage that way. Because if if you try to work within the system, uh, once you start having success, it, it immediately like it's so resistant that it just turns on you like a, you know, like a, a sickness or a virus that's inside the system and the immune system just like goes after itself to eliminate any kind of shift or change to that status quo. Right. We didn't cover it in the beginning, but, you know, Tim has a quite the entrepreneurial background, has launched several small businesses on the side and does quite well. So when he says uh, something, I definitely want to listen got some great insights now that being said he may or may not have the best judgment uh which gets us into tiktok <laughs> so uh so let's talk about tiktok all right before we get started um jake yes or no have you ever used tiktok never unless <laughs> never you've never so i've never downloaded the app i've never used it. it is forbidden in my household much to the chagrin of my 11 year old daughter Okay. But I have seen TikTok videos that have been like reposted on Twitter or via YouTube. So via a secure channel, I have consumed the stray TikTok video, but I've never used TikTok. Okay. Tim, yes or no? I think we already know oh, the answer. Absolutely. To that. Absolutely, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. And I'm I'm in the middle, so I I uh, I was a, a hard no and then I gave in to peer pressure, and the interesting part about this is Tim is the one who convinced me. I think he's a Chinese spy. He says, you got to get on TikTok. I'm like, well, what? And this kind of goes, we're trying to growth hack the newsletter through some, some videos and things for a while, and then I was like, this is just a waste of my time. I will say, it, it, the algorithm, the way that you scroll through and, and the things it puts in your feed is amazing, how it figures things out, um, but we're not here to talk about their algorithm, which is amazing. Um, but we're here to talk about all the other stuff, which is why we're t it's a topic for us, right? Not our not our kids. So, uh, Tim, you have TikTok on your phone right now? I do, yeah. But I, I don't have anything to hide either, right? So it's kind of one of those things where we're like, yeah, I mean, I recognize that it's a, a vector and a threat and all that other kind of stuff. But but there's also, it seems to be like a lot of goodness on there, you know, and and, and whether or not, you, you know, a lot of people use it for that. I mean, there's there's obviously all the bad stuff and it's, it's quite alarming at how frequently it serves you up um, things that, that like insidiously erode like democracy and like respect for authority and things like that within our, our systems. Right. For example, like auditing the police and, 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 you know, the first amendment audits and all, all that kind of stuff or, or mm -hmm. police misconduct. Right. You see quite a lot of that on, on TikTok, And I'm pretty sure that's probably standard across the board, which is, you know, surprise, look at that. Right. It's showing unrest within our country. But there's also a lot of like, you know, how to how to growth hack or how, you know, business and marketing and, and you know, venture and, and product management and just all sorts of different topics, too, that that is a, a different kind of learning medium that the algorithm feeds up for basic, you know, and kind of helps educate you if you're on that early stage of learning to where you want to kind of move forward or try to improve or, or you know, build something out. So, yeah, it's definitely a mixed bag, but you, you almost have to be very, very aware and well, self-aware, right, of, of what's being put in front of you and like what's happening because it's a slippery slope for sure. Tim, do you worry that like that media diet that it can slowly and perniciously influence your opinions? Like I know every, if you ask someone if they're a good driver, everyone thinks they're an above average driver, right? And if you ask me if I think that I am poisoning my intellectual capacity uh, based on like the media I'm consuming, of course I'm gonna say no. Right. And I do it, I'm sure, on Twitter, like just like I would do it on TikTok. Uh, but, but do you think that like there is like a pernicious effect, even if you're trying to be conscious about it in consuming, you know, what the Chinese Communist Party wants you to consume ultimately? 
Oh yeah. I mean, absolutely. Right. And, but there's that risk with anything, right? Like there's that risk of, of, you know, being, you know, influenced by, by messaging within the DOD or within the government and like, or the, the media within we have. And it's just one of those things where you kind of have to be smart enough about it or hopefully aware enough to where you recognize what's going on. And, and it's, it's almost like, at least for me personally, like, you know, I'm not going to recognize it on the subconscious level and, and things that happen. But really, I think what would happen is, is an authentically staying true to, to who I am as a person. And then whenever I notice like different behavior changes, right, or mood changes or things like that, or, or maybe I respond to a frustration in a, a different way than what I, you know, would have preferred to or, or what would have been a, a more measured way, right? Then you can kind of be like, wow, you know, and you kind of look back and you're like, man, how far have I deviated? Holy crap. Like, I didn't even realize that I've gotten to where I am. And then you kind of have to have to make a correction. So in order to kind of mitigate the risks of that, right, you kind of have to tighten down your 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 bumpers right in the bowling alley to kind of keep you on the straight and narrow to where you want to go and what you're trying to do, um, which it, it requires a lot, a lot of self-awareness. And, and to the fact where maybe I don't even have enough of that myself all the way through, but um, you know, if that's where I kind of pay attention to is the behaviors and, and my emotions and how I react to things. Interesting. So I think for the, for the people who aren't, uh, or maybe are not completely aware during COVID, uh, TikTok exploded in the U S and there's a Chinese version of it that I can't pronounce that was kind of going strong for a couple of years before that. And then it became, you know, the administration. So President Trump and uh, and a lot of Republicans started talking about the the security issues with TikTok. And it and there was a time, a short period of time, uh, maybe maybe not so short, where that actually became a politicized issue of is it bad or not? Like why I don't know why that's a left versus right issue. Like the facts are the facts, and it's pretty objective. And I think that uh, now, you know, fast forward a few years and all the things that have been happening. I think it's pretty pretty well known what the what the dangers of of that app are, and you know India banned TikTok uh, about two years ago, and it, even China has their own controls on what they limit their their children to, which is another issue for alternate conspiracy theory we can talk about. But right now, you know, the FBI basically uh, has come out and, and said that the you know the national security threat of that is uh is basically three points uh the first one is uh i think jake you mentioned it the chinese government can use it to control the data of everyone on the platform the second one is it can control the algorithms which is the influence for tim uh so what kind of cat videos and, and dance videos that he likes to he likes to look at and then the third one is the control of the devices that the software is in, installed on and so and there was a point where they were talking about ban it or buy it. So you sell it to a U.S. entity. I think it was Oracle that was trying to buy it for a while. And that, I think that fell apart. And so we're kind of back into where we were two years ago. Nothing's really changed, right? Yeah, I, th I think that's right where we're at. Um, people are saying ban it now. I've heard a lot more ban it than ban it or buy it in the last couple months, um, which I'm, I'm fully behind. I think w one of the things about the app, that you didn't touch on in, in the three ways it can be an attack vector um, is that I think it can be used to gradually implement effectively what the social credit score is in China here in the US. Um, and we saw a hint of that maybe about a year and a half ago. TikTok was experimenting with rolling out a hiring platform. And the way it was going to work is that employers would upload their open positions. And I'm sure it was going to start with like seasonal jobs for Target or Amazon, relatively low skill sort of jobs where you've got 10,000 of these available across the states. And then TikTok mm -hmm. users would opt in and say, I want a job and like these are the areas I want to be in. And then the black box algorithm would start matching employers and prospective employees. So they would become the platform by which you get your job. Well, take that and blow it out five or 10 years down the road when now they're the platform for connecting people for prestigious influential positions, right? Well, TikTok knows the kinds of videos and content you consume. They know if you're a friend of policies that are uh, favorable to the Chinese Communist Party, or if you're always talking about, you know, 
the Uyghur genocide and a free Taiwan and you know, whatever, and they can start killing your career prospects here in the U.S. or matching you with a great job here in the U.S., right? Uh, now imagine, like, every Silicon Valley company, you live long enough, you become a, a fintech product, right? You start rolling out uh, buy now, pay later programs, credit cards, mortgages. TikTok absolutely could build that in as a brand extension, especially, like, if they start building out, like, a TikTok commerce on their platform. And now... You want a mortgage, you don't get it if you've been, you know, sort of antagonistic to, you know, the, the wishes of she, right? Um, and all of a sudden, we have the social credit system here in the States via a private company. Um, it's And that it sounds kind of crazy, sort of like tin foil hat kind of conspiracy, but we know that's the kind of thing that they'd want to do. And I just saw a stat like two weeks ago, that something like 33% of Americans now get their news via TikTok. Like it's a platform with a lot of reach and it's growing very quickly. And so it's not absolutely crazy to think that at least somewhere in the roadmap is this idea of we're going to start dramatically, not just influencing people based on the information they're getting, but carrots and sticks in the US. Like, are you favorable to Chinese policy or not? My favorite conspiracy theory for TikTok is that it's it's very simple, but it's so simple it's it's just it's just right in front of us. We just don't see it. Which is they are trying to get our kids addicted to watching stupid videos instead of advancing in science and technology, engineering and math. And that's how they're gonna win. Is all of our kids are gonna be addicted to watching cat videos and things yeah. and meanwhile they're the they're, they're racing to uh, to surpass us technologically and as a society and, and and the one the one data point besides tim's uh cat videos that uh <laughs> to point to is that the it's i don't think it's a tiktok thing in general it's just a, a social media thing it, i don't think most people realize like china who has developed this thing that's so viral they actually don't even allow their own kids to use it uh more than 40 minutes a day so the apps, all the apps, social media apps in China are limited for kids, 40 minutes a day, and that's it. And the Chinese version of TikTok, it's, it's time limited, and it's also content limited. So the algorithm in China serves up, uh, it serves up party videos. So they talk a lot about sort of Chinese history and like towing the party line, right? So you're indoctrinating your people very early on. And it serves up STEM videos. So it's science experiments and little hacks for, you know, math that's are like great appropriate. And you know, it's like, it's educational content. It's not what our kids are seeing. Yeah, you can be viral in a great way. So maybe that conspiracy theory is maybe not so much of a conspiracy. So <laughs> I wonder how much of that is really a, a, like a function of the algorithm though, right? Like, like if that's what you start liking or, or watching your watch times for the crazy cat videos, cause you're like, well, it's kind of, you know, awesome. And then it feeds you more of that. Like on the early, early stages of that account, you know, I've, I've got tons of educational content and videos and things like that, right? Like there's there's a guy on there, his name, I think is like Andy Math or something, right? But he goes through these crazy, like complex math problems and like, you know, the the different solutions for him and, and walks you through how to do stuff. And and that's that's pretty legit, right? It's, it's kind of interesting in a kind of a cool way. But um, yeah, most people aren't, aren't going to be served up that content, right? Because they're just not engaging in, in those kind of inherently, like they're not just inherently curious about those particular topics, right? Like it's much, much easier. You get the dopamine of like the, the, the cats dancing together or whatever is going on. There's a lady, if I remember right on TikTok, all she does is Excel hacks, like, you know, 15, 20 second videos yeah. of different Excel things. And if she's got, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who follow her. I mean, so that there is some value added, um, whether or not it yeah. you know makes up for all the bad things that we talked about. I, I also get the lady who teaches me Chinese, which teaches me how to swear in Chinese too, so or say kind of inappropriate stuff. So there there is that, right? I mean, who knows? They're already getting to you, Tim. I'm telling you. <laughs> all right, let's talk about the last topic of today, which is uh, American dynamism. Um, just when you think the buzzword bigo card could not have another thing added to it, here we are, American dynamism. So could uh, I don't care which one of you guys want to go first. Could somebody tell me what this is, who came up with it, and why we need to add it to our buzzword bingo card? 
Jake, you're pretty connected in these circles, right? I did I did not get an invite to the American Dynamism Summit, and I, I saw that you were a speaker. So uh, you spoke at the summit. Okay, yeah, you're auto winner. Bigger firm buys the buys the brunch. No, I, I was not a speaker at the <laughs> at the Dynamism Summit, but I was oh, okay. I was an attendee, so I was there. So what is American Dynamism? That is a great question. And I think, I mean, you could, so American dynamism was a phrase rolled out by Andreessen Horowitz, which is one of the larger, more prestigious venture firms in Silicon Valley. I guess now they'd say that they're um, region agnostic. They're sort of, they've gone full national. And you can go on their website and you can read their description of what American dynamism is. It's fairly broad as they interpret it. Uh, so it includes, I think, education and manufacturing and national security and anything that broadly speaking, makes America more dynamic, as the as the phrase would imply. That practice that Andreessen Horowitz launched maybe a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, but I think more like a year ago, has done wonders for uh, raising the profile of certain kinds of investments, particularly investments in dual-use technologies and sort of national security relevant tech. Uh, and I think it's because, you know, Andreessen, one, they're prestigious, and B, it's just, it's brilliant marketing. Because before, nobody in Silicon Valley would touch defense tech, and most founders didn't want to build for the Department of Defense. But, you know, who doesn't want to be part of American dynamism? It's, like, it's a great, inspiring phrase. What it means in practice, though. Hold on a minute. I remember you writing an op-ed about how dual-use technology was a trap. Did I remember that right? No, no, I did. <laughs> okay, so I'm yeah. not going to ask you to defend your defend it here. I'm just just an observation. You you mentioned dual use technology. I just I just had that pop into my head. Like yeah, I'm pretty sure I read that uh, you know a month or month or three ago. <laughs> it is a trap, and it's used as a cop out by the Department of Defense, and it's a it's a great topic for another day. Yeah, let's we'll put a pin in that one, and uh, I'll let you defend yourself at a, at a future episode. <laughs> you know, one of the, one of the cool things that that I, I picked away when I at least checked out their site, right, is is it says that it, in their thesis that the companies view government as a customer or competitor. Well, it says customer, competitor, or key stakeholder, but I, I zeroed in on customer or competitor. You know, so there's there's a way that this potentially can you know dynamically disrupt all of the cemented in bureaucracy that that is within the Department of Defense and federal government, right? I mean, historically, whenever you look at, at the research and development and things, the, the government and the DOD specifically has gotten very, very good at developing technology inside of the Department of Defense and then commercializing it outward, right? And then you've got 30 and 40 years of cemented in bureaucracy and processes and things that have kind of made it resistant to change, all while the meantime that federal R&D has, has diminished, but commercial research and development has, has expanded and just blown through the roof, Right where it's now like an 85 percent 85 15 or 90 10 or somewhere around there right um but the policies and bureaucracy and processes within the department and in the federal government have have kind of failed to to keep up with pace of change and and so now you know how do how do we you know start i guess we when I, the general the royal we but how how do we as a nation or, or as andreessen or a venture or whomever right start investing in companies that that can actually help to start chipping away at that so that we can effectively integrate and transition commercial technology to support our warfighter and build out military capability. My question is that this is a, a VC kind of generated uh, movement, if you will. And Jake, you we were talking VC back in the beginning. And if your fund cycle is somewhere between eight and 10 years, it's optimized for a lot of things, but it's really incompatible with some other things. When you look at advanced technology and hardware, not just software. So, I'm wondering how American dynamism is going to be compatible without changing an investment model uh, to support that, you know, the rebuilding of a more dynamic, resilient American, whether it's economically, educationally, capitalism. So, and it's, and I don't even know, you know, we're recording this in December, this thing launched this movement or the idea of a movement launched you know, a year, year and a half ago where the economy was a little bit different place. Inflation was in a different place, interest rates. So, I'm just curious, if, you know, how do you see that kind of weathering the storm to be an actual long-term movement? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, 
So, I mean, hardware investing is a little bit easier, or deep tech or frontier tech investing, right? Like investing in really hard technology problems, right, that are still at the the science experiment stage or in the lab or where maybe the lab works, but the engineering certainly doesn't yet, right, where you can actually make a, a workable product. It takes more capital than just investing in software, generally speaking, right? These are like big generalizations, which is easier to do when capital is cheap. And capital is cheap when the Fed is printing money and buying assets and interest rates are, you know, effectively zero. Um, it's a different world now, right? When the average 30-year mortgage all of a sudden is 7% instead of 2.5% or whatever it got down to. So it remains to be seen. As practiced by Andreessen Horowitz, before American Dynamism, I would say, they were almost exclusively software investors. Post-American Dynamism, there's still really software investors. I mean, they have invested in some companies that touch on hardware, but usually software, at least in my read of their portfolio, is like the major driver, the major value driver for those companies. And so they haven't really dived into the really hard capital intensive hardware investing yet as part of American Dynamism. Now, they did inspire, you know, 20 other firms to sort of jump into the American dynamism bucket because venture is very much a, a lemming business. And like I said, Andreessen's very influential. Um, and I think a lot of those firms are going to get bit hard because one, they've never really dealt with the DOD before. And so they don't understand how non-rational the DOD can be, at least sort of in on short term cycles. Um, and two, they haven't been as uh, judicious with the money they deployed in hardware companies is as Andreessen has been, right? Sort of they bought the they bought the mission or the vision, but not sort of the the process. Um, I think that's going to turn off a lot of investors in the next couple of years because they're going to get burned. Yeah. <laughs> Two things I can think of. Uh, number one, like welcome to uh, welcome to the party, pal. <laughs> that was uh, 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 Michael Bloomberg had a, a thing from the he's the president of the uh, Defense uh, Innovation Board. He kind and he had an interview. I think it was last week, and he said, "I didn't realize how hard it was to uh, to do business with uh, the Department of Defense." And I, I just replied to someone on LinkedIn with just the, the gif from Die Hard, like, welcome to the party, pal. <laughs> it's the same thing with this, with the amount of buzzwords at the Pentagon that come out and they, they go through the, the, the Gartner hype cycle, right? <laughs> so they, they peak and then they crash and then people go, what, what were we actually trying to do? And we you know, sort it out eventually. I think this is going to go through the same thing. The, the, faster that we can get through that peak of expectations and then through the trough of a uh, disillusionment, then we'll be on the, uh, the path to enlightenment. And so, well, I think there's a lot more questions and answers right now on this, uh, on this movement. Tim, any thoughts? You know, what? whenever you, you kind of tie it together, right? Whenever, uh, if I can rely on American dynamism to break me out of the, the mental hold that TikTok has on me, whenever the time comes, that's what, uh, that's what I'm banking on. Right. <laughs> So it's, it's kind of just a matter of, you know, the belief in, in Western ideals and in kind of American exceptionalism and our dynamic ability to respond to threats as they come, right? One of the things that kind of pops into my head, and, and I'm sure you probably know a little bit more about this from your time in the Marines there, Mike, but, you know, the whenever, whenever we were in Iraq, and, and this is probably a good, like, maybe 08-ish, around that time, circa 2008, but and maybe a little bit before, right? But, but you know, our, our, our troops were basically getting eaten alive by IEDs and, and things like that. And, and especially like the, the ones that they could basically like the form the direction for the projectiles and stuff. Right. And it was, it was pre MRAP, but then watching how, how that threat came out and, and, and started kind of putting us at a disadvantage and then how quickly we were able to respond to build and, and field a capability that responded to that threat. You know, in, in my mind, that kind of is something that, that, you know, and, and right, wrong or indifferent, I don't know the whole story behind it, but I'm sure there's probably nuance and, and, you know, things that were, you know, that worked really well and, and didn't as well, but um, that, you know, that kind of stands out. And then before you know it, like, you know, fast forward a few years and, and now those, those things aren't necessarily a threat, right? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and so, I mean, did you did you have to deal with a lot of that stuff? I mean, is, is that kind of a, a correct 
interpretation or perception on my end or, or what, what are you thinking the mrap itself is a is a fascinating topic there's so much we can talk about and and actually uh what i heard was dual use is a trap the story of the mrap and how it's maybe the exception and the anomaly jake wanted to talk about the uh the army venture capital corporation at a later date so i think those are three topics that we will we'll do a follow-on episode maybe the next episode maybe a couple down the road uh, Jake, Tim, any parting shots? My last thought on American dynamism for today, I think, is it's easy, right? Like when you're a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So I'm a VC, so every problem looks like a problem that the right finance tool can help solve, which I think is a very American uh, take on things. So I'm all, all for it. But I don't think American dynamism can be just about what companies are we investing in and are we seeing uh, startup, right? New companies in ed tech or manufacturing. I think that like what made America so strong in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s was uh, this like cultural hegemony. Everybody in the world, even if they hated Americans, they wanted to be Americans, right? Like they watched Baywatch, they wanted to wear Levi jeans, they wanted to drink Pepsi. And there is a certain amount of power and influence in the world that comes from just being the, the culture that everyone wants to replicate and the place where everyone wants to live. Uh, we've lost that. And th that's like probably another episode is to talk about like how we get that back. I haven't lost it. I love being an American. But how do we start exporting that again to the rest of the world so that they, they want to be us, right? Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a great point. Tim, any, uh, any parting shots? Yeah, just I mean, I, I really appreciate y'all, you know, coming together and, and making the time to, to come together and talk about this stuff. And uh, I mean, there's there's definitely a lot more to unpack in, in future episodes. All right. On that note, that's it. That's the episode. Go tell your friends. Hit subscribe. Like us on iTunes, wherever you get your pods. Follow us on the socials. Do what you got to do. We're out. This has been The Merge. See ya. See ya.